You're listening to ayahuascapodcast.com. I remember the first time I died during an ayahuasca ceremony. I died and it felt really comfortable. I was like, oh, this is great. This feels nice. I think I'll stay here forever. I was in a void. It just was like darkness in a void. And it felt so comfortable. So like the actual death itself for me in that ceremony wasn't the hard part. The hard part happened when the medicine came and said, okay, now you need to be reborn. And I was like, I don't want to. So I'm arguing. I'm arguing and trying to negotiate with uh, this deity, which to me, ayahuasca is this deity, this female feminine deity. I'm arguing with her, telling her that I don't want to be a human again. And the place that I'm in is much easier and I don't want to come back. And she's like, you have to come back. You can't stay here. In this episode of Ayahuasca Podcast, I interview Maria Sofia de Lacos, a death doula, conscious dying coach, and therapist. Together, we explore topics of navigating the thin line between spiritual gifts and mental health issues, the concept of good death, and the Maria's initiation to become a death doula, grieving practices and the art of embracing death, experiences with ayahuasca and the intersection of death and plant medicine, heaven, hell, and life after death, according to Maria. It's a great episode. I'm sure you will enjoy it. This episode is sponsored by Lawira Ayahuasca Retreat. At Lawira, we combine affordability, accessibility, and authenticity. Lawira, connect, heal, grow. Guys, I'm looking forward to hosting you. Hi, guys, and welcome to Ayahuasca Podcast. As always, with you, the host, Sam Belief. Today, I'm having a conversation with Maria Sofia Di Marcos. Uh, she's a death doula. She's a facilitator, uh, conscious dying coach, and a therapist. Uh, Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sam. So good to be here, all the way live from Greece, no less. Um, yeah, that's, uh, we're going to talk about that as well, uh, Greece specifically and what brings you there. Uh, but, uh, before we go into deeper topics, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, how did you find yourself in, in, in that line of work, uh, you know, spirituality and, uh, and such. Well, I actually, as a young child, I would say as early as maybe three years old, I always had an inclination, an inclination to see other realms, I would say, or, or things that were the unseen. Um, I remember even as early as three, I envisioned uh, some sort of death realm as a child. And then I remember speaking with other beings, but which I called angels at that time to my parents. And my parents were very scared, um, especially since I grew up in a very religious household. My father was Greek Orthodox and my mother is Seventh-day Adventist, which is a very diametrically opposed Christian denomination, but very intense in their beliefs. So even as a young child, I had gifts, abilities of sight. And unfortunately, my very well-meaning parents thought that it was something that should be put under control and that we should stop it because it was considered something that was outside of what they believed and potentially works of the devil, evil, all of that, which is is rather interesting that now that I look back on it. So I always have that inclination. My father, when I was 17 years old, tried to commit suicide. So I decided to become a psychotherapist from that experience because it was obviously very traumatizing, and I never wanted anybody to go through that again. I didn't want anybody other than myself to go through that again, so I decided to go to graduate school and become a psychotherapist after I finished college. And I did that for five years, and I worked in a high-security, locked psych psychiatric hospital. I almost said psychedelic hospital, um, a psychiatric hospital, and I, I did that for five years, and it was really depleting and demoralizing. Um, the system in the U.S. is very much a, a sick care system, and it's not about helping people to get better in any way. It's more about symptom management and giving people medications to control them, to control who they are and what they're seeing and their symptoms. So I actually left. I had a spiritual awakening. I left 
psychotherapy. And I went into corporate America of all places and I went into marketing and I was in marketing for almost 12 years. And it was a very, uh, of all things you'd think like marketing seriously, but it allowed me to use a lot of my psychology background with just people's behavior, which is great. But then I saw the corporate greed at the higher levels. And again, it was very disheartening. And I knew that there w- there needs to be a better way for me. There needs to be something else for me to do where I can use my gifts and abilities for people's greatest and highest goods and, and just the people in the world and the planet. So yeah, I it's been a roller coaster journey. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. And uh, it's interesting that you, you kind of slipped uh, to almost say psychedelic hospital and uh, put me on, um, on a train of thought, you know, how great it would be if we had a psychedelic hospital, right? Not like uh, like a place you come to and you take some ketamine and have uh, two doctors sit with you, but like like a, like an actual hospital. And um, I guess um, that, would be, that would be a dream for me to create, you know, uh, as opposed to just an ayahuasca retreat, but actually have more 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 medical stuff but you mentioned your gifts right and um uh a lot of times uh people that can be spiritually gifted and can see stuff maybe predict future talk to spirits uh a lot of times in 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 our society they would be like well you're you're obviously schizophrenic right so that that line is very thin i don't know like have you thought about it um where where is that line or how, how does one tell a difference or is there a difference that's a great question. And it's so tricky and nuanced. And it's dependent on that person, what they're experiencing. Um, I could see that in my own life, I've had situations where what I was seeing was very disturbing to me. I used to have night terror slash visions at night, where they're terrifying. I remember being 13 and just being scared of going to sleep because of what I was going to see. Like all, all, it, it was like almost an ayahuasca journey at night being 13 and not knowing how to navigate or manage it in any way and not knowing what was going to happen. So every time I closed my eyes, I would, I had insomnia for a long time because I was so scared of what I was going to see. So I think it's really nuanced when it comes to the line between pathologizing people and labeling people with schizophrenia or other mental health uh, disorders and what is you know oracular visions or sight as people called it and i would imagine if i lived three thousand years ago and i were to turn up in a temple with who i was as a you know as a five-year-old or as a six-year-old i would just immediately be put into the temple and be made be trained be trained to work with my vision but if I, you know, if it was right now and I had a five-year-old who came to me and said what I said, perhaps if I was a therapist, I would think that they had a mental health issue. So it's really time, time, context, the culture, what the culture sees as um, divergent behavior versus normal behavior. So it's, again, it's so nuanced. And it does have to do with the context of the person, because in in other cultures and other indigenous cultures, I would imagine if you're in Peru or other places, if a child were to turn up with these types of qualities, they wouldn't be seen as they would not be seen as mentally ill. But in the U.S., they more than likely would be seen as mentally ill. Yeah, it's almost uh, in some in some aspects of life where we're living where normal what is normal now is actually sick and what is considered sick sometimes is actually a little more normal. But you mentioned temples, right? Uh, you, if you were, you know, if you were born in ancient Greece and you came to, you would probably be sent to some kind of temple and be trained and uh, become some kind of oracle or something like that. So, and you are in Greece right now and you are Greek. And I think you know more than any of the guests we had on the show about Greek culture so talk to us about that. You know, uh, I believe uh, you were going to uh, go to temple grounds and talk to the spirits. How did it go? <laughs> How did it go? What they say? I'm actually going to the island of Crete next week, uh, where the Minoan civilization existed, and they had also their own mysteries. So Crete had its own mysteries. The island of Crete is the largest island in Greece, 
And they also had a what we now call in Western society a cult, a bee cult, like bee, the actual the winged creature that 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 beautiful little bee there. They had a cult and they had priestesses of of the bee. And also they had a there's a goddess. There's a goddess that is holding two snakes, one in each hand. They, She's a very old goddess. They don't understand very much about her. And there's also a, it's like a, a plate, a, a circular plate with cuneiform on it. And it's called the circle or uh, the circle of Thestan, Thestion. And it's the Thestion disc. That's what it's called. And no archaeologist has been able to decipher what it means or what it says. There's actually, I, I want, if I'm not mistaken, there's four of them. And nobody knows what it means. Nobody knows what it says. They believe that it potentially talks about a goddess cult. So I'm going to create on the 17th, so next week, and I'm going to commune with that disc. And start asking questions and having a dialogue with it, as well as that deity, that snake-bearing deity. I'm going to have a conversation and dialogue and see what what these beings want, what they want, what knowledge and wisdom they have, and how what my role is within that dissemination of their knowledge and wisdom. Like what, how can humanity move forward? Interesting. Uh, um... About, I'd be interesting to find uh, to know what you find out. Um, yeah, snakes, you know, is a very very common symbol, right? And with with work with ayahuasca, people, you know, every second person sees snakes, and it's generally a positive thing. But I, I you know, you don't really know what's going to come up. But talking about mysteries, right? The illusion mysteries, uh, Eleusinian mysteries, are the more famous ones. But there is. There's different mysteries in different islands, as you say. So uh, I would assume that, would it be safe to assume that they were also working with some kind of plant medicine, kind of like uh, like Eleusinians did? Absolutely. Uh, so my cousin goes to Mount Athos, which is a very well-known, very well-known monastery up in the mountains. And he brought me back honey. And this honey, he, he brought back honey for me before. And I, I looked at him and I said, this honey is not honey, it's medicine. And he said, 100% this honey is medicine. And in Crete, they have a lot of honey, which I also see as medicine. And I also believe that they have other psychedelic rituals with either mushrooms also, there was something about potentially acacia, so ancient acacia, which is very rich in DMT. So DMT rich acacia, mushrooms certainly, potentially honey that has other psychedelic components in it. And I think that in Eleusis, they had, you know, uh, ergot, which was is the precursor to the LSD. The the cookion has three hundred ingredients in it. So the that brew that they created has a lot of ingredients and we only have three of the ingredients because the rest of the recipe quote unquote was destroyed and working with ayahuasca i asked her if she could help me to resurrect the recipe of the kukion and she said she would help me but it's not going to be the same she said you're not here to make the same recipe you're here to make something similar but i will help you so it's not going to i don't think Maybe someone will crack that code of the kukion and get all 300 ingredients in the right percentages and, and mix. But I think what I'm here to bring in is something new with very ancient roots. So my own work with medicine has brought me to that conclusion. And I see ayahuasca as my greatest teacher. And I have deep love and reverence for her. And, and I trust her. I really trust her. It's incredible to to think about, right? Um, Kikion was lost, or you said Kukion, probably you know the better word, Kukion. Uh, and uh, Soma, what you know, ancient Indians were using was lost. And how lucky are we that ayahuasca wasn't lost? Because it's a, I mean, imagine if we knew that there was a thing called ayahuasca and it's just these two plants, but we don't know which ones. Imagine how long it would take us to, to find it. But not just the recipe of the medicine itself, but the entire tradition 
the shamanisms and the lineages. So we're so lucky that um, that that survived. But yeah, it is. Uh, I believe it is the key to um, to finding the other stuff because I've heard I've heard of a story uh, of there is a medicine called Wilka, and I've tried it myself. And it is when you consume a San Pedro cactus and then you get a DMT snuff blown up your nose. And it's it's actually very similar to ayahuasca in my experience. But uh, what they said is that the, the way they discovered it was recently rediscovered this is that they were drinking San Pedro in in one of the in one of those ancient megalithic temples in Peru. And as they were drinking San Pedro there, they could see all of a sudden the inscriptions on the temple start to make sense. And those inscriptions taught them to go and get the seed of that plant and then use it. And honestly, Wilka is much stronger than just San Pedro and, and much more profound. So I, I do believe that, I don't know if you have any ayahuasca with your mushrooms, but uh, which probably would be illegal in Greece, but if you could like um, take some other psychedelics and then through them try to, um, I mean, I'm sure you have your gifts, but it probably would be stronger and you could, find the recipe there'll be a fascinating story i don't know um it just sounds so great um one one thing one one question i have for you do you do you know about um which mystery does um minotaur belongs to minotaur belongs to the island of crete yeah so it belongs to the island of crete and there is a labyrinth, like that's where the name labyrinth came from. He is, he was placed in a labyrinth and it was, he was actually created by his father, long mythological story. But um, yeah, the Minotaur is on the island of Crete. What is, what is the meaning of him? And, and I'm asking for myself because maybe two months ago I had an ayahuasca experience where for some reason, and it, it never happened to me before, out of like probably hunger plus ceremonies, but I, I was actually becoming a minotaur and I freaked out and I kind of shook it off. But I, I was, you know, I could see, you know, fur and I was feeling like this, not really minotaur, but it was like this presence of like a, a bull plus a human and but it didn't feel evil or something like that because the reason I freaked out was like you know this this is something evil you know animals and you know bulls specifically doesn't have a good reputation when it comes to like organized religions but but it felt really actually when I went back to those thoughts it, it felt really natural and just like animal and like kind of like, kind of strong but but kind so I was interested maybe you could help me decipher that well what would that mean for me. Well, uh, snakes don't have a good reputation in organized religion either. <laughs> snakes and bulls and all kind, uh, kinds of things don't have good reputations. But what I would ask you is, what does a bull symbolize for you? What is What does that mean to you? When you saw yourself as the minotaur or this bull, half bull, half human being, how did it feel in your ceremony when you, you embodied that? So my... my- my reaction to that, because it never happened to me before, as like, I, I it was not just like a vision. I, w- I, I was seeing my legs and they were becoming hooves and there was this like kind of grayish fur and I and I could feel myself, um, you know, making bull sounds. And it was, but it felt, it felt like for me, bull is, uh, I, I'm, I'm a Taurus by sign. So I guess it kind of makes sense. But for me, bull signifies, I mean, power persistence kind of like gentle power i I think and and um yeah that's 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 kind of what i think about it but it's it's not the it's not what it what it was it's my reaction to it really really scared me so but now after i analyzed it next day i was i was really hoping i could relieve it but it never happened again so i scared my uh my spirit animal away is there something in your life where you feel you need more persistence or power in? I mean, uh, in this line of work, uh, there's not ever enough persistence and uh, willpower for me because, yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult running an ayahuasca retreat and, you know, everything that comes to it and building. And sometimes I'm surprised why I'm not burnt out just yet. Or maybe I am and I don't know how to diagnose myself. Well, maybe perhaps as a interpretation, maybe your vision 
in medicine was telling you that you already have all of the persistence and the strength that you need. It's really accepting it and receiving it as your own and not to be fearful of how much power you actually have. That's a good interpretation. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, let's not make it um, a therapy session for me. <laughs> let's, um, but yeah, this so far, this conversation is really interesting to me. I'm like uh, spending 50% of time with goosebumps, which for me is a sign that something, something interesting is coming through. Um, uh, let's switch topic from Greece to, um, you know, you're be, you being death dual and how you, you know, most people avoid death in their, in their life experiences. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to touch it. It's, uh, it's seen as something negative. Why do you not only embrace it, but you explore it and you help other people through that process? How did, how did you become a death dual and why? Oh, my dad was mentally ill as I mentioned before and he was obsessed with death his mother died when he was 16 months old so he never really remembered her and his father died in front of him when he was 12 and so my father always had a fixation on death and as I was growing up I remember I was 10 years old that was my first my first funeral that I went to with my father and my father would take us the funeral constantly and he was always talking about his own death and it's so interesting now coming here when I come to Greece I think I've spoken about death in Greece to just relatives and friends every single day if not multiple times a day it's a very acceptable conversation it's not demonized in any way it's not seen as taboo it's so refreshing to be able to just discuss death openly because as you said in the U.S. it's more it's something that's more shrouded in fear and let's not talk about it because if we don't talk about it, it won't happen somehow. Like people think that they can cheat death or they can escape death. And, and here, here in Greece, that's not, they don't believe that they really are very close to it and, and have a level of understanding and openness that I haven't experienced elsewhere. And I think because of my beginnings, as a child, constantly being in that realm of people dying around me, going to places where people who had died are celebrated, and then working within as my little kid self, seeing how grief is processed in, in families and in, in friend groups and communities. I think that is what really prepared me and catapulted me into wanting to be a death doula. I, I think the the biggest, most transformative experience that was really like very clear, like you're going to do this is uh, four days before my father died, I was in an ayahuasca ceremony and Madre Ayahuasca told me exactly how I was going to handle my father's death. She explained like point by point, this is what time you're going to go to your father's house. This is what you're going to say. This is what's going to happen. He's not your father anymore. Like he's gone. He's going to die like within this week. Like she was very, very, very specific. This is what the room is going to look like. This is how you're going to center yourself. This is how you're going to speak to the caregivers. This is how you're going to speak to your mother. This is how you're going to speak to your father. And, and now let's grieve. So in that ceremony, I was able to start the grieving process, even though my father was still alive. He was going to die in four days. But I started the grieving process. And the medicine said, this is the work that you're going to do with others, but you need to start. This is your initiation. Your initiation is your father's death. So give your father a good death and then you'll be able and prepared to work with others. So I did exactly what was asked of me. And I, I remember like writing everything down once the ceremony was over. And on the day that he died, the medicine came back to me. So it's four days later, the, me the ceremony ended on Sunday. On Thursday morning, the medicine comes to me and says, okay, call your mother. Tell her you'll be there at seven in the morning. You're going to stay there the entire day. And I was like, what? I'm not going to go back to my house. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to. She's like, you're staying there the whole entire day. And you're going to stay there for longer than that. But stay there. Ask your father what he needs. 
she instructed me. And everything that I saw in my medicine journey and all the instructions I was given, everything came to pass exactly as it was given to me. And once he actually died, I remember just sitting there thinking, I, I passed my initiation. This was my initiation. I've done it. I've completed this initiation. And not only that, but I felt a sense of pride, like I was able to do this in the way that was in the highest good. And my father had a good death. And then I was like, okay, now it's time for me to move forward and start to hone my skills and get more education and train even more so that I could help others. Wonderful. And um, you mentioned good death, right? And there's uh, there's a story I've heard you say about your your husband's best friend dying of suicide and then kind of haunting you. Can can you talk about that and why, you know, what's the difference of good death and not good death and how souls can get stuck? I can't get stuck. So a good death to me is a death that is conscious, meaning that it's the death that you want, that you've decided, I want to have all of my family and friends around me, or I don't want anyone around me. I'm choosing this. I am consciously choosing my own death and how it's going to be. And if we look at it from a macro perspective, everybody chooses everything that happens anyway. So, but from the micro level, if you, if you go down into the weeds of being a human, my, my ex-husband's best friend, you know, he chose to take his life. He was, uh, incredibly troubled. He was drinking alcohol heavily and he was also taking antidepressants with the alcohol, which of course is just not not a good mix by any means. And he was very, very troubled. And he had a girlfriend at the time and the girlfriend contacted the authorities and told them that he had explosives and he had guns and that he was dangerous because they had gotten into a fight. So the police came up to his cabin. He was living in the woods. He was living pretty much in isolation at this point. He he saw the police. Maybe he got scared. Maybe he had pre-planned it. But then he shot himself and died. And it was very shocking to me because I've had I had very in-depth conversations with him about spirituality and death and life. Um so the fact that he would do that was very shocking. But then he started showing up at my house in terms of being behind the closet doors at three and four in the morning and pounding on them like he was inside the actual closet door. He would move things in the house. He would break light bulbs. Uh, my ex-husband at the time was he was not a, a person who was particularly spiritual. He was a skeptic and at one point, he was shaving, and in the mirror, he saw his friend that had died right behind him. And every time that I would try to remove that particular spirit from the home, with sage, with palo santo, whatever I was trying to do, um, invocations, calling in the light, all of the techniques that I know, it was though I was being choked, physically choked, because that spirit didn't want to leave. So it was in the in-between, it was very uneasy, it was very unhappy, and I was stuck in that. I felt like I was stuck in that because I couldn't move him because my husband at the time kept calling him in. I kept trying to push him out and be like, hey, you need to cross over, you can't be here anymore. But then my husband at the time kept calling him in. I did not, I wasn't able to actually call him out to get him removed until 10 years later. I left the home like two years after that happened. I left the home. So it's not like he followed me, but I did have one vision of him. I think it was last December where he came to me and he said, I need you to cross me over. And I said, I can't cross you over because you have contracts with my ex-husband and he's not going to let you go. And I, because we're so close to each other, I can't help you, but I'll find someone who will. So I went to a psychic medium and this other energy healer. They work as a team and they were able to take that person and move and cross them over. They took them to this place that's like a, a rehabilitation center, an etheric rehabilitation center. 
for people who are stuck in the in between and have contracts with people and it's and it's complicated. So they were able to actually cross him over. I was too close to him to be able to do it. Interesting. Um, yeah, that sounds very scary. Um, so some some gifts are some spiritual gifts are scarier than others, and uh, this one is particularly scary. You know, uh, feeling that, noticing that. Uh, my my wife is very sensitive to um, to any kind of presences and beings, and other, also other people's sp- spiritual uh, energies. I'm not. My my gift is more in the, in the realm of like healing and physical healing, which is great. And I sleep calmly at night. I don't feel anything. I don't see anything. Um, so that's uh, that's that's great. Uh, for someone, um, since uh, <clears throat> uh, we talk about the topic of death, let's say a lot of people come to ayahuasca because they they're grieving a loss of a loved one. As as a professional, what will be your um, recommendations for like grieving better what is the what is the um, skill there grieving is an art i think and grieving is a practice and uh, one of my teachers francis weller talks about the five gates of grief how there is more than just the grief of a lost loved one Uh, he wrote a book called the wild edge of sorrow and he believes that in order for us to grieve, quote unquote, better, being around community and actually ritualizing the grief, like having grief rituals and grief ceremonies so that people can feel more contained and they can feel supported within their grief, within their community and their family. So I think for me, it's really important to actually feel grief and allow grief in and not to have all of these conditions on it. Grief should only last for a year. Or, oh, this person wasn't a blood related, you know, a blood relation, so you shouldn't be sad and you should just get through it. People have these very strange ideas about grief and limitations. And grief is a season in people's lives and seasons last long it's not linear grief is not a linear a linear thing at all and it waxes and wanes and i think when people go into ayahuasca ceremonies or mushroom ceremonies because they want to release grief what i've seen if that's the intention i've seen people come to front and center all of the grief just getting a tidal wave of grief because the medicine it's like it's not gonna say, oh, you want to get rid of this grief? Okay, let's get rid of it. You're going to be like, no, we're going to feel it all now, right now. We're going to look at all of it, and you're going to feel all of it, and you're going to feel all the depths of it. And so I think the first step is really to allow yourself to grieve in whatever way it looks like for you. And not to judge yourself about what grief looks like. The more you hold it in and try to keep it in the lanes of what society thinks is as long as you're not hurting people, if you, as long as you're not physically hurting anybody or yourself, then expressing your grief in whatever makes sense to you and allowing that to be is the first step. Step. So if it means dancing, if grief, to, if your expression of grief is ecstatic dance for three days, or if it means singing, or if it means just staying in your bed in the fetal position in the darkness for the couple of days, like whatever it means to you, or there's times where, you know, you feel like you're okay and then you need to go back into your bed and then you need it, you know, whatever it looks like to you to allow that expression to fully blossom and not to, not to stifle it because you feel like you're an inconvenience to others. Thank you. I think that's, um, that's a very valuable uh, advice for anyone who is uh, grieving. Uh, I know your your medicine of choice is ayahuasca, and ayahuasca is known as one of those medicines that um, shows you death and helps you um, rehearse that process and kind of takes away some of the fear of dying. Um, can, can you talk to us about that? You know how how ayahuasca is helping you being a death doula. What are the lessons maybe you've had from ayahuasca? I remember the first time I died during an ayahuasca ceremony 
I died and it felt really comfortable. I was like, oh, this is great. This feels nice. I think I'll stay here forever. I was in a void. It just was like darkness in a void. And it felt so comfortable. So like the actual death itself for me in that ceremony wasn't the hard part. The hard part happened when the medicine came and said, okay, now you need to be reborn. And I was like, I don't want to. So I'm arguing. I'm arguing and trying to negotiate with uh, this deity, which to me, ayahuasca is this deity, this female feminine deity. I'm arguing with her, telling her that I don't want to be a human again. And the place that I'm in is much easier and I don't want to come back. And she's like, you have to come back. You can't stay here. There's no way. And so I'm arguing. So that could have happened for probably an hour. And, you know, it's in two hours. But then she's like, no, 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 you're going to be reborn right now. And not only are you going to be reborn, but also you have to consent to it and accept it with happiness and joy in your heart. And I was like, are you kidding me? I don't want to I don't want to leave this place. This place is great. Why would I want to go back into the messiness of being a human being? This is you're not giving me a lot of options here. And she's like, no, you're going to you're going to be reborn, but you have to consent until you consent. You're going to be in this limbo. So I consented. And I remember opening my eyes and seeing a birth canal. Like with veins and blood and flesh, like seeing an actual birth canal and then feeling like a rush of wind coming towards me. And I remember a lot of times in ayahuasca ceremonies, there's a lot of mucus and like blowing of noses and all of that. But I remember I was like, why is there so much mucus coming out of me? And the medicine saying it's not mucus, it's amniotic fluid because you're in a womb and you're going to be reborn right now. And I was like, oh no, okay. And I remember just going through that portal of being reborn and feeling the wind on my face coming through to the other side. And it was very destabilizing as an experience because again, I remembered where I was before and how easy it was to be there. So for me, it's not so much the dying part that I have the issue with is the coming back part. <laughs> the coming back part is, I think, part of my processing of, okay, consenting to come back into a human body, into a human more form over and over again. And, you know, being better every time that you come back, taking the wisdom that you've learned from the other side and the pain of being reborn. But using that pain and that discomfort for good. And so whenever I've worked with clients, especially if I've worked with clients with 5-MeO-DMT, hands down, they all say that, oh, death. They, They get to the death place and they're like, oh, not so bad. Oh, wait, but now I have to come back. It's the coming back part that people are like, I don't want to do this. This is too hard. Being a human is is challenging. Uh, so then a question to you from, from that knowledge you collected from plant medicines and also your, your experience around that, um, first, what happens after that? And is there, is there hell or heaven, you know, like this, uh, this Christian view of it? I can speak to my own experience. Um, that's the lens I come through. So people could take it for what it's worth. If it resonates with them, fantastic. If it doesn't, please keep it to the side. Um, For me, I do not believe in heaven and hell. I believe that we are currently living in the heaven or hell that we create on this planet. And heaven and hell are not a place in my in my estimation. After we die, I believe that I go back to eternal source. People call it God or oneness the all. I go back to that place. And then I spend time in oneness, whatever time means, because time is so such an illusion. And then at at some point, I go to source and I ask source, what planet needs the most help and how can I help them? And then I get my assignment to go wherever I'm supposed to go to help. And everything is told to me. Everything is explained what will happen to me when I come to Earth or another planet or wherever I go. And I consent to come back to Earth, let's say, for example. And I ask 
you know, I consent to come back here. I also am able to select the gifts that I bring with me to help with the challenges that I will face as a human being, let's say. And then once I consent, I incarnate into a human body and I'm here for however many years I live and the cycle keeps on going. And what is the purpose of this? Is that like your your soul coming over to learn some lessons or how do you view that? I think that it is about learning and it is about relationships, being in relationship with others. To know yourself, a lot of times it's helpful to be with another. That's where there's that's where there's synergy, that's where there's conflict. And through conflict and um, cohesion, you can learn a lot of things about yourself. And so I think it's just a matter of wanting to learn and expand because I think this universe and God or source, I think it's just such a generative, creative being. It just wants to create all the time and learn and expand and just keep on going into infinity. It doesn't stagnate. It just keeps on bringing more. It's so abundant in that. So to learn more things in depth, to, to have it, to have fun, to have interesting experiences. Uh, I would imagine just being in the oneness and being in this a stagnant place would get really boring after a while. You want some novelty. So Earth is a great place if you want novelty. <laughs> There's lots of uh, novel experiences here. So I think we we come here to learn. We come here to expand. We come here to bring more love to the world, love and joy. And yeah, I, I think that's the whole point. Being creative, bringing more. Um, what do you think uh, ancient Greeks uh, said? If you die before you die, you don't die when you die. I think they said that because they knew that if you were to confront that fear of death, that you would live more. I, I, I think people... I think there are some people who are so frightened of death that they don't live. Like they just live in a constant state of fear and panic, just paralyzed, hoping that, you know, death comes, but they're not there when it happens, which I think it's a Woody Allen quote. Uh, I'm not afraid of death, but I don't want to be there when it happens. So I think there's people who don't live because they're in fear of death. And I think that quote is about living like living like death is just another it's just another experience and if you see it that way rather than with fear you come to death very empty you don't come with regret because at the end of life people share their regrets that's the number one thing that they talk about all the regrets they have about what they didn't do what they didn't say within their life so i think that quote has to do with like living your life without that fear of death because you know you're you're going to come in some other form. It's not the end of anything. It's just a transition. It's just an initiation into something else. You kind of touched upon my what was going to be my next question, but um, you describe um, the process people go to when they're, you know, they're, they're left six months to live and they need to work with all their regrets and unsaid words. So my question was, uh, can somebody go through that process right now before they even are ever, you know, knowing that they're dying and basically just, uh, would that affect their, would it make their life better? I had to go through that process within my training and I had to, and I, I got to work with someone else who was not, who was not in a terminal space. Within my practicum, I worked with several people who are not in that terminal space going through that process. And I think that you can do the process of asking about regrets in each of the spheres of your life at any time. And I think it does make you realize the value that your life has. And it also clarifies how you are living your life and how you're not living your life. If you have many regrets about relationships with, you know, parents or siblings and they're really bothering you and they're holding you back, if you're in a non-terminal space and you're able to do some sort of clearing work or reconciliation work while everyone is still alive, it, I think it definitely has a positive impact in your life. 
I think we should do life reviews every year, like during New Year's rather than these big New Year's Eve parties. Let's have life review parties where we figure out what happened during this year, what are the regrets of this year, and how we can bring something new into the new year where there, those regrets don't exist. So I think life reviews with all the spheres of your life are a great tool to have, even you know, not in the terminal space. Yeah, it's um, it it seems to make a lot of sense to just um, like what what can make you more conscious of life than death, and like just analyzing yourself and kind of there. There's this good uh, way of uh, living life. It's like asking yourself what what are, what are people gonna tell about you on your deathbed and stuff like that. It does. I mean, I understand what you're saying about death as being a relief, and I think I've experienced that myself, and I've heard it from like hundreds of uh, patients that come through through our doors. Um, but still, you know, there's like, yeah, there's this hesitancy and resistancy to think about it because, like, I think, yeah, may, we're souls that come here to learn lessons, and we're part of God, the, the God that's so bored, and He like creates this little. It's like watching a telenovela for God. He just like parts and like role plays uh to entertain himself or herself or itself or whatever but um i think those little parts of those souls they're programmed not to want to die because obviously then how are you going to play this game of life if you die early uh yeah this is a fascinating topic and uh, there, there are no definitive answers but uh, i know that for me personally after i started working with uh plant medicines my outlook on death and on life completely changed and you know i i consider myself a spiritual person now all, all thanks to ayahuasca um and i think it's a it's a better it's a better way of living life if you're let's say that's not true let's say you and me are mistaken and we're actually we're we're mistaken there's there's something else but um is it is it better to live your life fearing that you're gonna die and then you're gonna rot and and there's no meaning to it or just yeah, where there's there's a meaning to all of it. I think it's it's just a better and more helpful belief system to adopt. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think I also think, in my perspective, what's really important, what has been foundational and life changing within my own medicine work, has been the medicine showing me my divine nature. That yes, there's this human. And I have a name and I come from somewhere and I have a family and all these things. Yeah, sure. I have this. This is true. It's temporary. But the thing that also exists is this very infinite thing. A spirit which has never been born, has never died. And I can tap into that presence whenever I want to. And I think as human beings, we forgot that that exists. And I think it makes us the most human when we realize that we are divine beings we actually have the spark of divinity within us and we're infinite just the shell goes away but the infinite spirit never goes away so i think if you were to treat everyone as you walk through life as a divine human being and you look at them as like this person is an infinite being which is pure love I think we would be treating people much, much differently versus let me look at this person just in a human scope, the physical quote unquote matter that they are and all of the personality and character and an ego that's involved in it rather than giving it more layers of this person's also an infinite divine being just like I am. We're part of the same exact soup or we're part of the same divine soup that exists. I think they were people would treat each other more human, like more humanely, rather than separating. I think the biggest lie, truly the biggest lie that's ever been sold to humanity, is that we're all separate. We're all unique. Yes, as human beings, physical human beings, we're all different. However, we're not separate. It's one being on, that's on this planet. It's not all these separate entities. It's just one field, one giant field. But we can't see that because we're so um, entrenched in other programming and thinking that churches and institutions have brought to us in order to control and manipulate people. And so if we were all to see that we're unified and that we were divine spirits, 
then governments would have a really hard time controlling humanity. The church would have a really hard time selling hell and selling sin and selling evil to humanity if we all realized how unified we actually are and how there is goodness. I believe that there's that human beings at our spirits at the core are good, that we have goodness and light and love within each of us. Some people tap into it more than others and others don't even believe it exists. And that's fine. But I don't choose to see it that way. Just how you were saying, what if it's what if we're wrong? If we're wrong, we're wrong. Like, I'm OK with being wrong. But this is how I choose to live my life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, but I can also think of some people where it's really hard for me to see any any spirit in them. Uh, you know how how far removed they are from from their spirit, and how I don't know what is it society or something that made us all so disconnected and distracted. And um, I mean, this is why I'm a big fan of ayahuasca. For me personally, it kind of shook me back to thinking in different ways and changed my life on so many different levels. So I believe that there's a lot of people that maybe otherwise will never get there. Uh, like they're there or like, you know, me, myself, a few years ago, I, I was, I was one of those people like so far removed from any, from my own spirit that it's only, it, it would only take something as strong as ayahuasca to like beat me out of it and just bring me to different ways of thinking. And uh, and it, it does it sometimes. It's just sometimes it's really really strong and really cruel. And uh, this is kind of this is kind of my mission, I guess. Uh, if if my soul has a mission, that probably it's about that. You know, spreading awareness of this plant medicine and how it can change your way of looking at things. So that's um, that's exciting to think about it this way instead of just like you know superficial understandings of it. Yeah, um, I know you also facilitate uh, plant medicine journey. So journeys. So my question to you, as a fellow facilitator, is: um, What are your uh, favorite ways to help people integrate? Um, and just generally, any any advice uh, to facilitators out there? I've recently in the last year have fallen in love with dietas like truly madly in love with dietas i feel like they are the missing piece for me when it comes to communing with the plant world and the mushroom kingdom and more so in terms of integration i would say more on the preparation side of working with plants say it's, there's people who are very leery and scared of working with psychedelics and which i understand but something like a dieta, it's far more accessible to them. And even though they diet something that's not a psychedelic plant, they are able to have a psychedelic altered state of consciousness experience through a dieta. So say if they diet bobansana, or they diet rose, or they diet blue water lily. So these things are not psychedelic on their face. But once you start to diet that plant and commune with that spirit and become partners with that spirit, you have psychedelic experiences. Your state, your state of consciousness, your state of being is altered. It, you go into a different dimension altogether. So I cannot speak enough, you know, positively enough about having dietas, whether they're in the jungle and they're isolated dietas or urban dietas. And some people can't let's say, go into the jungle for two weeks and diet Bobansana, they can't do it. I understand that. And I'm not saying that people should start that way either. I think meeting people where they are where in their lives, and if you could do a one-week dieta with Rose, fantastic. Like an urban or a suave dieta, that's great. Start there. So that people get used to the idea and notion of there are other beings that are in plants, these are spirits. You can commune with them. You can have a relationship with them because then it makes it much easier down the road once they've had a few dietas and they've received healing or insight and wisdom or direction in their lives through these dietas for them to say, okay, I have three dietas that I've done. And now I think like psychedelics 
now I feel more comfortable and I can work within psychedelics. I can maybe go into an ayahuasca ceremony and speak with Mother Ayahuasca. I can, I'm not uh, so foreign to it. It's not an alien spirit. It's an actual plant spirit. And I commune with other plant spirits. So I think it's a way to gently guide people who maybe have reservations about psychedelic experiences to get them to a place where they feel a little more grounded and comfortable so that they can gain all of the lessons they need to gain in the healing from ayahuasca ceremony. And then integration is much more profound. And also it's not as jarring. They're able to have roots into what they're doing because I have seen people go through massive transformations within ceremonies and then within two weeks it's all disappeared. And I'm sure you've seen that too, Sam, all the time. So I think gently bringing people in and step by step, low and slow, starting with non-psychedelic plants or say if they have some experience, even using psychedelic plants within dietas. And then putting them into a much more intense container where they have a ceremony and then going into the integration phase. So I think it's more so not just integration, but how we bring people into the plant medicine world. Thank you. That's a great explanation. And uh, funny enough, in Colombia, in Colombian ayahuasca tradition, dietas are not that common. What What they work with a lot here is purges which I guess is similar but more faster and intense way uh, to do those things. But I'm, I'm interested about it. And it's like, uh, funny enough, there's a lot of plants, even like garden plants that grow here that are psychedelic in nature, and a lot of them have, you know, spirits. And you can kind of like, it's, it's almost, after working with ayahuasca, it's almost kind of becomes obvious you, some plants they just have kind of more of a appeal. And... Um, yeah, I'm I'm very curious about it myself as well. I think I will explore that topic um, to see if I can learn something there. So, uh, Maria, thank you so much for for this episode. I think we're we're getting close to an hour now. So, uh, before we finish, is there anything else you want to say to the audience, or maybe is something we haven't touched upon, but you would like to? No, just for people to open their hearts and not believe everything they've been taught. There's much more than what we've been shown, I I could say, in the Western world. There's much more out there available to people and not to believe the imagined disabilities and limitations that have been placed upon you and to open your heart to other possibilities. Open your heart to yourself first and connect with that divine spirit that I was talking about because there is everything you need you have every single thing that you need you have inside it's just a matter it's not a matter of learning it's really a a matter of locating of locating your own internal wisdom and knowledge and to do that by it's opening your heart to yourself yeah we need to do a lot of learning but we also need to do a lot of unlearning and that's um that's important right now because there's there's so much information that is not true. So, um, Maria, where can people find more about you or maybe get your services as a death doula or facilitator or coach? I have a website, the Maria Sophia Demarco, or the Maria Sophia, and then I'm also same same name on Instagram, the Maria Sophia. And then I also have a podcast of my own called Suddenly Spiritual, and it is more so geared towards people who are very new to the spiritual path, or maybe they're kind of midway point, and it's helping people to gather and build self-awareness so they're not being um, programmed or or moved in ways that are, are not the best for them. So it's more of an educational podcast. Again, it's called Suddenly Spiritual. You can find it pretty much everywhere. And yeah, and the Maria Sophia. Thank you, Maria. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I've learned a lot from this episode and remembered a lot. So thank you for coming on and thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Sam. I really appreciate you and all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, guys, uh, you've been listening to Ayahuasca Podcast. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. And I'll see you in the next episode. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to support us and Psychedelic Renaissance at large, please follow us and leave us a like wherever it is you're listening. Share this episode with someone who will benefit from this information. Nothing in this podcast is intended as medical advice, and it is for educational and entertainment purposes only. This episode is sponsored by La Huayra Ayahuasca Retreat. At La Huayra, we combine affordability, accessibility, and authenticity. La Huayra, connect, heal, grow. Guys, I'm looking forward to hosting you. Con la guaira, limpia, limpia.